what the Lord said. And uh, I think that right now, before Paul comes, that I'd just like to reach out to him and ask God to give him the strength to just go right on through and what he has to say. I love to pray for the man that's going to preach. You know, he's always praying for us, isn't he? And we want to turn that around right now. And while Paul's sitting there, let's just reach our hand out and begin to ask the Lord to touch him and anoint him and really deal with him on this afternoon. Father, even as we reach out to this dear brother, would you touch him and anoint him and lift him up? Lord, give him your strength. Lord, give him the strength that you bestow upon your servants, Lord. Touch him in every way. Touch his mind. Touch his heart, Lord, and illuminate him into the things that he should say to us this afternoon. We ask, Lord, that you would open the ears of those that will hear, Lord. Let them not turn away, Lord, at this time time, Lord, but let them hear this message. We ask you in the name of Jesus. Amen. And without further ado, my brother in Christ, Paul King. Thank you, Ray, and I love and appreciate you people. I Every time I preach heavy messages, I think of something that's just a little humorous, and I don't want to um, put a damper on what God has done to me uh, or for me, uh, for me in the last few minutes. But uh, the late Ethel Waters used to sing in uh, our meetings, and of course, she sang a great deal of the time in the Billy Graham Crusades, but we had when we had meetings on the West Coast, she was our singer. And um, it was a pleasure to have her as a friend. And one day she was telling me about being on an air flight that was rather treacherous. And she said that um, a turbulent storm uh, was in the making. And finally, the plane was uh, being tossed about and dropping many feet through the air, and the passengers were very frightened. So the stewardess managed to make her way down the aisle to where Ethel was uh, seated, and she said, Miss Waters, the people on this plane are about to panic, and would you sing something to quieten them down, or we're going to have a real problem. So that darling, precious black woman, she said, my eyes must have been as large as teacups because I looked her in the face and I said, honey child, you forget one thing. I am a passenger on this plane too. So when God is speaking so heavily and so anointedly, someone will walk away and criticize me, but I want to clarify something. I'm in this thing too, friends, without humor. I'm in this thing too. I heard some of you talking about the heaviness of this message and being critical of it the other day, and I love you, I love you in spite of it. But my friends, God is speaking to us. He's speaking to us. This is a solemn occasion. This is a solemn occasion. I've never had God deal with me as treacherously as he's dealing with me these days. And I don't think I've ever come close to loving God as much as I love God and his Christ these days. I love him more than anything in this world. He's the lover of my soul, and I wouldn't trade the communion I have with the Lord here of late. Or uh, as the song goes, a vast domain or a kingdom or mansions on the hills of this earth. I love the Lord Jesus, and I fear God. And what I'm about to share with you today is straight from the heart of God. Now, I'm going to preface my real message by saying that tomorrow, please don't let this meeting just uh, phase out. Uh, 
like it has in years past or the last couple of years our Sunday afternoon meetings have been poorly attended but when we had um, those great afternoon meetings when William Branham was here and then even a couple of years when we had those afternoon miracle meetings over in the old Ramada and how many of you remember those uh, meetings well those were some of the most precious uh, meetings and the visitation of the Lord came on that last day uh, in a marvelous way and I want you to claim that and prepare yourself for that tomorrow will you would you just reverently if possible just reverently take hold of someone's hand right now and whisper to them I love you so much and God loves you too our God loves you and I love you so much too would you just say that God loves you and I love you too I love you with the love of the Lord amen and now precious Father God if you will not allow your presence to dwell on me the way you have once during this convention I just pray you'll take me home right now I'd rather die right on the spot if I can't feel once more that wonderful touch of your omnipotent hand and just a tiny fragment of your omniscience touching my brain oh god would you do it once again would you illumine my thinking until the mind of christ has spoken will you use this worthless slab of clay until everyone can say jesus passed this way today lord i'll give you all of the praise and all of the glory and honor and recognition we're not just interested in someone being healed that would be marvelous we're not just interested in many saying i received my prayer language today or i have been speaking in tongues all day father take us a step beyond show us what communion with the christ is all about show us what it is to bear his image show us what it is to turn loose on this world the wonderful presence of almighty god in his christ thank you for it lord please put a desire and a hunger in the hearts of us all to never settle for anything less no matter if it's an angel sent from God please Lord we want even more right now the angels don't know what we feel they can't sing the song we sing they can't walk the way we walk they can't talk the way we talk oh God please help us to settle for nothing less than your own presence and righteousness in Jesus name amen I want to talk just briefly about I mean I mean stop you just we want to put these four panels up so that the message doesn't get wiped out we just want to what we like to do is put these four panels up to completely close the noise out and then we'll go right on you just I don't want to stop anything we just don't want all that noise going on while Paul is preaching can I just go on? You go right ahead. Thanks. Maybe we should stand for the reading of the scripture while they're doing that, and let's uh, open the Bibles. Uh, if you have them with you, open your Bibles to Exodus, the second uh, book in the Bible, to the 33rd uh, chapter. And would you please uh, forgive me if I... Uh, once again experience soul and, uh, and 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 the spirit of god embracing are coming together because it's the most glorious experience that anyone can ever have it is uh, one thing to worship god in a soulish way but when that soul 
is sanctified by the Holy Spirit of God and soul and spirit are in tune, it is the most powerful and most glorious experience that a believer can come into. Do you have any idea what I mean? How many of you have an idea of what I mean this afternoon? It is a glorious thing. And um, we're going to experience some of that. Praise the Lord. Well, I think the word should have such preeminence before I talk about angels and before I talk about the heavy, uh, pertinent subject matter that is absolutely from God. Now, I don't want to uh, manipulate anybody and I don't want to play Mr. Big Shot or Superstar, but God has spoken to me today and he's spoken to me in the wee hours of the night and you haven't seen me in the lobby uh, since uh, late last evening and you haven't seen me about this place because I have been in communion with God and uh, if that be true, and it is, then I charge you, if, if unless it is an emergency or you have a physical problem of some kind that can't be healed or uh, you, you just uh, hold steady, will you please? Because I can tell you of a truth that God is speaking through me to you and I'm in it with you and I'm not trying to hurt anybody. I want to make this journey with you and I want us to come to a place where we can minister together in such power. I love God's multiple, uh, the multiplicity of God. I love the arithmetic of God. One can uh, chase a thousand and two can set ten thousand to flight. Oh, if two can agree as touching anything, it shall be done of our Father which is in heaven. Don't you see how God works? And the enemy doesn't want you to get together, but God does. Let's hold together. It won't be long. I don't, uh, I, I'm trying not to take long. I lost my watch a while ago. I don't know whether that was some uh, something spiritual or not. But uh, they told me I had a limited time to speak today. And of all the days, I lost my watch. And that's the reason I'm here early. And I had my watch, I w would be late. But um, that's a little funny. But Ray, if you'll just, you know, give me those signals like they used to give us on television. Uh, I think I remember them. It's been so long since I was on television. I was on in BC. That was before color, way back there. So, But if you'll just give me some kind of, you know, 10 minutes to go or something like that and give me the privilege of ignoring it, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> but I want to be very serious with you. And when the anointing of the Lord does come on me, I want to make one thing clear. Please don't put me in your pigeonhole or mold me. Um, I get broken before the Lord, but I get liberated and uninhibited when the Spirit of God comes on me. And uh, I, I feel a smile in my heart and then I feel agony, and it's just a sweet, sweet misery. Glory to God. It's just a sweet and wonderful, comfortable, miserable feeling. I just love it. Exodus, the 33rd chapter. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it, and I will send an angel. Isn't that wonderful? God said, I will send an angel. He promised, Moses, I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and uh, all of these enemies were to be driven out. And how many of you would settle for an angel of God driving your enemies away today? Sometimes I think I would, uh, and I have had that happen. But he said in verse 3, Unto the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people. Please, 
I know it's not what some want to hear, but you are a stiff-necked people, God says. We are a stiff-necked people. And he says, I won't go with you personally. I won't go with you personally, lest I consume thee in the way. What if I told you the other side of God today? Would anybody listen? We hear about a God of love, a God of compassion, a God of mercy, a God of Cadillacs, oh, pardon me, a God of um, uh, resorts and a God of mansions here on earth and a God of um, plenitude measure and a God of all kinds of sustenance and, 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 and help in this life, a God of a new wife, a God of a new husband, a God of a new blessing pact, a God of prosperity. But if I stood here and told you about the other side of God, would anybody remain? I hope you will, because I charge you, Almighty God is in this place today, and I know it for a fact. But he said, I'll not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. How many of you have known the word, God is a God of consuming fire? And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man did put on his ornaments. And the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. The Lord told me to say that to you and me, and I'm hearing my voice right now. We are a stiff-necked people. God says that stubbornness is as the sin of idolatry. God says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You might file that. We'll check it out in a few minutes. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore, now put off thy ornaments from thee, that, that, they, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. Oh, friends, there's something we have to strip ourselves of today. There's something we have to lay aside every weight and sin that doth so easily beset us. And uh, there's a pain in my heart as I say this. There are things that God has revealed to me that will not work any longer. I cannot have uh, hidden away a wedge of gold or a, Bab a Babylonish garment. I have to do away with it. I have to get out of the numbers racket. I have to get out of doing God uh, a service without his will. I have to come to the place where I hear him speak and know his way. Praise the Lord. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of all these things. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out into the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Friends, if we do not, I, I don't mean to preach to you while you're standing, but please, uh, it's going to help you. It's going to help you. If we don't bear the reproach of our Christ outside the camp, we're in trouble in these perilous days ahead. The only people that are going to be able to go through these things, and thank God uh, for, for all the promise of being caught up, but those that have to go through some of the things will never make it unless we bear the reproach outside the camp no suffering with Christ, no reigning with Christ, no cross of Christ, no crown of glory. Hallelujah! And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent, at his tent door, and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle that the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. 
How many of you can say, I'm in a position for God to talk to me today? If God spoke to you, would it kill you? If God spoke to you, would something good happen to you? If you are right before God and have a heart of purity before the Lord, God will speak and something good will happen to you today. If you continue to be stiff-necked and rebellious, something terrible is going to happen to you because God is going to judge his people and judgment begins in the house of the Lord. I'm not sorry for saying that, because thus saith the Lord. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar standing at the tabernacle door, and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Now, I could terminally weep myself to death right now if I gave myself over to it, thinking of the bliss and the joy of God being my friend and knowing me on a first-name basis. How about you? Oh, God knowing your name and mine and calling me by name. He called me by name when I was just a small boy and told me what I was to do in later life. And, oh, I've been on a first-name basis with God off and on ever since. I have wandered from the Lord, but I've never been able to get away from the melody of his voice and the sound of a multitude of waters and yet is wooing as a mother's voice to her darling baby. It is a beautiful thing to have God communicate with man and speak to him on a first name basis and call him face to face and say, because you speak my truth, because you are my chosen, because I knew you before you were formed in the belly, before thou camest forth from out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee to be a prophet into the nations. If God knows you that way, it's the most priceless thing in this world. Hallelujah. Oh, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Listen. If God knows you by name, and if you have found grace in his sight, without glory and honor coming to you and to me, if we know that today, we will turn the world upside down. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And now, therefore, I pray thee, Moses said, now, if it, I know it's true, God. You said, I found favor in your sight, and you know me uh, uh, by name, and you call me by name. And, and, and he said, now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way. Remember, the Bible says, God showed the children of Israel his works, his miracles, his signs, his wonders. They got signals from God. But to Moses, he showed his way. We know secrets that can penetrate the Iron Curtain today because we talk to God face to face. We know what's happening and what will happen to this world. It's the greatest product. It's the greatest byproduct of walking with God and knowing God and being a Christian is to know what's about to happen next and have peace about it. Praise God. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found uh, uh, grace and in, in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, and that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, 
My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy present go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? It is not, or is it not, in that thou goest with us, so shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Praise God. Let's thank him for it. I... Thank you, Lord, that you know some by name here today. You will not say, depart from me, ye rebellious workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Lord, you will say, I know you by name. Enter into my rest, my beloved. I know you by name. Praise the Lord. Verse 18, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. You may be seated. The cry of my heart this afternoon is for you and for me to see the glory of God. Jesus tried to tell Martha uh, that she could see the power of the resurrection and she'd see the glory of God. He said, said I not unto thee, if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God. But Martha didn't understand. All day long he said, I stand with my arms outstretched to a rebellious uh, people and they don't understand. I offer them my glory. I offer them my power. I offer them my answers. I offer them my ways. I offer them my total guidance. But they do not understand. They are, they, they do not consider. My people does not consider. They're rebellious. They're in reversion. But old Moses said, Lord, if I've found favor in your sight, I want your presence to go with me. And if I can't have your presence, I don't want that angel. Thank you for the angel, Lord, but I want you. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I can't settle for an angel, Lord. I want you to personally go with me. Isaiah 58, when we have dealt our bread to the hungry, when we've given our lives, there's about 50 ministers here more today, and you know you've given your life to the gospel, you've given your life and committed it to the work of God, and you have broken your health by sailing through every hospital in your city to pray for the sick, and you've exposed yourself to all kinds of communicable diseases, and you've done all kinds of things, and you said, oh Lord, what's in it for me? I comfort you, man of God. I comfort you, handmaid of the Lord today by saying, God is about to say, I know you by name. I will surely guide you personally. I will be your guide. You don't have to look to another. I will personally guide you. And if that's the case, the Lord is going with us. Hallelujah. But I want to speak about angels for just a while because uh, he said, I will send an angel before thee and I will uh, drive out your enemies. I'll do all this for you. But Moses said, thank you, Lord. But if you don't go with me, if you don't go with me, if you don't go with me, just forget it. That's a strange and awesome thing. That's a strange and awesome place to reach. When my mom was dying of cancer, two, uh, 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 both of her breasts were eaten away with two malignant cancers. Her heart was affected by the cancer that had eaten all the way through the tissue, almost to her heart. She had a, a serious heart malady. She had three large malignant tombs in her womb preventing my birth. The Lord sent an angel. The angel stood by her bedside and said, Daughter, be of good cheer. You shall live and not die. 
and the uh, fruit of your womb, uh, uh, the, the fruit of your womb is a male child, and he shall be born, and you shall name him Paul. He'll preach my gospel like the Apostle Paul of the Bible, like the Apostle Paul of old. And I thank God for that angel, but can I base the rest of my journey on the fact that God sent an angel. It's wonderful. Mom is 94 this year, and she's going about like a, a 25 or 30-year-old woman at times. She eats chili and, and corn chips and uh, Coca-Cola for a bed night snack, and it just drives me up the wall, and yet I say, oh God, what on earth? How could you keep her like this? And all these years, the Lord sent his angel and told her she'd live and not die, and she was healed. Her healing baffled the crowned heads of American medicine in 1929. Dr. Lucas of St. Louis, Missouri, said it was the first experience he had had with tissue being recreated, and only Almighty God the Creator could do that. And I was raised on the very breasts that were eaten away with cancer. I know that's hard for you to believe. Well, you just keep on unbelieving. You belong to another group you're not even supposed to believe. Just keep on your fulfilling Scripture, and I appreciate you. I don't hate you. I'm not going to fight with you today, you're supposed to be that way. But there are some of you here today who are called and you know the Lord on a first name basis and you know that it was God who can do those things. You know that God is a God who reveals secrets and causes things to happen, uh, cause things which are not even as though they were, praise God. So after all these years, Mom... Uh, having uh, clear lungs without tuberculosis, tumors that disappeared that no doctors have ever been able to find a trace of. And uh, how many of you believe I've been born? How many of you believe I'm a boy? God sent his angel, and that angel told the truth. But I can't base my ministry on that alone. I said today, thank you, God, for that angel. Thank you, God, for that angel. The angel of the Lord used to stand by my favorite, or if I had a favorite, my uh, intimate friend, the late prophet William Branham. The angel of the Lord uh, guided him and told him uh, what to do in regards to me and my ministry and how to send me to Europe in his name and, and his place and his stead and preach to 180,000 people. As marvelous as that is, I can't. I can't base my faith on William Branham's angel or the angel of the Lord that has appeared to me because I've come to the place in these latter days when I know that even the, uh, 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 the Lucifer we know and the devil we know will transform himself into an angel of light and deceive the very elect if it were. So thank God for the angels. I know they've been real, but God is calling us in this last this last chapter, we're not living in the last days. We're living in the last chapter of the last days, my friends. We're living in the very last chapter of the last days. And I was thought, I'm, I'm always thinking something a little humorous because I don't want to be completely grouchy like many people. Saints are. I don't want to be an old sad face, long faced Christian. I think of happy things occasionally. And I was thinking of um, the angel of the Lord that used to appear in our meetings in Los Angeles, California, on the stage of a great church out there one night. People began to come to God by the score, and I thought, why? I haven't sang almost persuaded yet. We haven't sang just as I am without one plea. I haven't done what I heard Billy Graham do. I haven't done what I saw Oral Roberts do. And it worked before and God was in it, but I haven't done anything and people are streaming down the aisles accepting Jesus. 
the angel of the Lord appeared on the platform and hundreds of unbelievers and sinners saw him and they came to Christ. And the Oak Cliff Assembly of God Church, in fact, the 87-year-old Assembly of God pastor, uh, dear brother Comstock, is in the audience today, and he married uh, uh, brother and sister Noah, the pastors of my home church. But in that church, that wonderful Oak Cliff Assembly Church, when I was just a boy preacher, I stood one night and I had never been able to win my father to the Lord and never been able to get him into the meetings where God was moving. And one night, uh, the angel of the Lord appeared on the platform of Oak Cliff Assembly of God and my dad came down the aisle weeping and he was a heart man. He had a heart uh, uh, that was tender in a way but as far as uh, the Pentecostals, he could not understand them. He wouldn't punch anybody in the nose who said, my, mother, my mother's healing was not of God. And he would uh, clean the floor up with them. But he didn't, he didn't uh, understand Pentecostalism because he was a method and they didn't believe in that method. <clears throat> But one night that angel of God appeared and my father, while I was preaching, he came running down that aisle and he said, I can't stand it anymore. I want Jesus to come into my life. And he received Jesus that day because the angel of the Lord appeared on that platform. But I can't. I come to the place today where God says I cannot, I cannot depend on that from here on out. We're living in a day when there are many voices in the world, there are many spirits in the world. We have to try the spirits, we have to try the angels. There is an increase of angelic force in the kingdom of the devil as well as the increase in the kingdom of God. And we know there are still many manifestations of angels and ministering spirits, but God is said uh, that is incidental compared to what I want to bring my people into. I want them to come to a place where they will not see the glory of the miracle the angel brings, the ministering spirit accomplishes, but I want them to see me face to face, and I want to know them on a first name basis. I want to be their guide. I want to be by their side. I want to tell them them where to reside. I want to tell them when to pull up, pull up roots or stakes and move. I don't want them to be led about by every angelic personal prophecy that comes. I want their marriage to be of me and let me do the joining together. Let me do the uh, wonderful, wonderful leading of your life. I was thinking of a humorous thing about angels Years ago in San Francisco, we had wonderful meetings, and I was driving. As a young man, I used to drive day and night, not realizing that someday my body would break under such a strain. But I thought the Lord's angel would keep me, and there would be no problem, no problem whatsoever. But oh, let me tell you, even Satan can manufacture his pseudo-angels to guide God's people if they will not. Oh, they'll say, Moses hasn't come back yet. He's not coming back yet. What happened to this man? Let's build us a God. Let's get another uh, guide. Let's get another angel. And that's where Pentecostals get in trouble. That's where charismatics get in trouble. Amen! So I was driving along all night long to try to get to Los Angeles after a meeting. And the angel of the Lord appeared in the front seat of my car. I was a prosperous preacher. I was driving the biggest old boxy Lincoln that you ever saw in your life and proud of it. But the Lord uh, helped me and he let my angel go along with me anyway. And occasionally he would appear to me. People thought I was crazy. But the angel of the Lord was sitting there in the front seat with me, talking to me, and I ran through three red lights right in a row, right down through the downtown section of Santa Maria, California. And it wasn't long until I came uh, out of my trance, uh, and I looked in the rearview mirror, and I saw, I saw red lights flashing off and on. And then uh, I realized that I was in the flesh again, and I pulled over to the 
the side and the highway uh, a policeman came out and one of them uh, went to one side of the car and he was shining his flashlight all over the floorboard and uh, he said may I uh, may I look under the, the seat and I said well of course I couldn't imagine what these four policemen were doing and they looked in the back they looked in the back, and uh, and uh, one of them uh, on the left uh, passenger side of the car looked at me, and he looked at the Bible I had on my dash. I always carry a Bible on my dash because I feel like if I ever hit anybody, the Word will hit me first. And... Uh, and look, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just saying all these things, and I don't know how to say them. But the, the, the patrolman, he looked at me, and the white flush of God came all over his face, and he said, Where is that man that was sitting in the front seat uh, with you just now? What happened to him? We've been following you through three red lights downtown. What happened to that man you were talking to? And I said, Sir, I've always been polite to policemen. I said, sir, I, I didn't tell him it was the angel. I just said, sir, that was the Lord. He said, what? I said, that was the Lord. And the white flush of God was all over his face. And I could see, I could see the ticket pad that he had in his hand wasn't too steady. And he looked and he said, the Lord, he said with a shaky voice, young man, are you a minister seeing my Bible on the dash? And I said, yes, sir, I, I'm a minister. And he said, oh, my God. He said, you and the Lord ran through three red lights right downtown. And he said it was, it, 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 it was lucky. I never will forget the way he said it. It was lucky for you and the Lord that there wasn't any traffic at that hour of the morning. And he said, young man, I don't know what's happening here, but I can't give you and, and the Lord a ticket. <laughs> he said, if, if you'll promise me, he kept looking over the passenger side, and he said, if you'll promise me that... that, that, that you and the Lord will get a motel room and spend the rest of the night. We'll forget this ever happened. He said, oh, God, I wish I could forget it. This ever happened. I wish I could forget it. My friends, I know, I know what it means to be visited by an angel. I know what it means. One day, a Pentecostal preacher had an incorrigible son. He was going by the way of the world. And that minister said, I'll help you financially any way I can with what means I have in the uh, realm of my means if you will take my son on a trip with you from uh, uh, from San, from uh, Midland, Texas to uh, Los Angeles to visit with his aunt and you can Try and get him back with God. This is the end of side one. Please turn the cassette over for the remainder of this message. That, and that young man almost killed me. He smoked. Uh, he was a chain smoker. And, and uh, I, I don't criticize you people who smoke. Uh, but uh, it was just impossible for my tender... Uh, virgin lungs to smell all that, you know, in a concentrated way, and I almost died, and he did it to be mean, and so finally we got to Los Angeles, and I was so glad to get rid of that young man, I was, I, I really didn't care at that time whether he ever got saved or not, uh, 
because I wanted him to smell some of the smoke I was smelling. So I went and, and uh, had my meeting, and to close the meeting, I went back to get him, and we made a mistake by going through the uh, Rubidosa Mountains, or whatever that is, that big, uh, uh, you know, uh, range of mountains in New Mexico, and a uh, horrible snowstorm came and covered the road, and we couldn't see the road, and there were some awful... Uh, uh, steep places to run off of on that road. And this boy had never shown me one ounce of respect. And all of a sudden, we stopped and he said, you're supposed to be some kind of a, a, a super a psychic or something. Tell us what's going to happen. Now, what in the world? How are we going to get out of this mess? And I said, oh, I don't know. Uh, and I was really fed up with him. And all of a sudden, I just... Uh, said, oh God, send your angel, send your angel, send my angel and help me out of this. The angel of the Lord appeared in front of that car and a beautiful white dove uh, 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 was like an ornament on the hood of that car, only it was just elevated a little above it. And that guided us down that mountain, but I've never been in a meeting like that in my life. All I heard was about 10,000, 10,000, it was like a loop on a tape playing over and over. Oh my God, my God, my God, my God, my God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. And that boy confessed every sin that he had committed before we got down that mountain. And then all of a sudden the car came to a stop and we were out of gas. And he, he said, oh, oh, when I get home, I'll live for God the rest of my life. And I'm sorry for what I've done to you and I'm sorry for everything. And all of a sudden, uh, there had been a tremendous storm during that snow, and lights came on right over uh, beside us, and we could not see anything. There was no moon, there was no light, and it was a horrible experience. All we'd had is the lights of our cars, and just in walking distance, we had stopped in front of the only service station and little grocery store for miles, and it was beautiful. So I thank God for his angels. But the Lord, the Lord has sent his angels to guide us. But I want you to know that I'm not interested. God forgive me. But I've come to the place where, God, if you don't go with me, if you don't go with me, I won't go with the angel because it's too treacherous now. I must know. We must get back to the Word of God. We must know, we must know, we must know the voice of God today. Can you say amen? I trembled on my way over here today because God was speaking to me about some uh, calamities and I know that uh, businessmen and, uh, and prosperous oriented people just absolutely despise me when I talk about prosperity. And they just almost hate me until they find out I'm right. But they just hate me because I'm telling you the truth that God has blessed you and God has prospered you and God has given you the power to get well. There's not an envious bone or jealous bone or a, 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 a jealous muscle in my body because Carl Williams has money or Demas Shukarian has money or all these businessmen have been blessed. There's no doubt in my mind but what God has raised up the full gospel businessmen. There's no doubt in my mind but what the angel of the Lord has been uh, camped around about them and, and worked with them and all of that. But the time has come right now when God says testing is here. And there's going to be a time when all of that wonderful prosperity may not mean so much this year. And I thought, oh God, if I tell them that there's going to be a shake up in the monetary system, if I tell them there's going to be a shake-up in government, if I tell them that there may be another um, uh, syndrome of the 1929 uh, uh, thing, or they might, there might be a bank closing or a market crash, they're going to really come at me with this and, and be personally offended. But I know they won't because it's time to hear from God. It's time to hear from God. What is the worst thing that could possibly happen? I thought of that beautiful building there, building over there for the um, monument for the full gospel businessmen's international office, and I saw the plans for that, or the, or the proposed 
picture for that, the artist's conception of that uh, last night, and it was so beautiful, and it was such a monumental thing, and I, I thank God for it, and I, I'm not saying this would happen, but I just say, they need that, they need that, that's fine, but oh, what would be the worst thing that could happen to the full gospel businessmen? Maybe a West Coast disaster would demolish that building, would demolish the headquarters, wouldn't that be devastating? That would be, that would be tragic. But God says, no, my son, that would not be nearly as tragic as what I'm about to reveal to you today. And then I thought of, oh, what if some of the businessmen tried to uh, get together again and could never agree together on anything anymore? And there would be such a power of the enemy to divide and to destroy this fellowship. Oh, God, that would be a terrible thing. And the Lord says, no, that is not as tragic as you might think compared to what I'm about to reveal to you today. And I thought, oh, God, my character is the most precious and priceless thing to me, or has been in the past. And, oh, for a single evangelist, for someone to look at a single evangelist, a preacher, and say he's never been married, uh, he, there may be something wrong with him. He may be a homosexual. And I thought, oh, God, that would be the most tragic thing that could ever happen to me, living straight before you and living clean before you, or for somebody to say he's a libertine or he's an adulterer, and all oh, that would break me to pieces uh, that would break me to pieces before today and I would be helpless to minister again and I said oh God that would be one of the most tragic things that could ever happen in my life and the Lord said no my son that would not be that would be unfortunate but not as tragic as what I'm about to reveal to you today and then I thought of all the things maybe there'd be rumors and maligning about the great men of God today and their ministry would be canceled out because of the horrible maligning and the lies and the gossip. And I said, Lord, that would be terrible to know that there were no true men anymore as far as the world uh, Christian population thinking. And the Lord said, no, that would be tragic, but it would not be nearly as tragic as what I'm about to reveal to you. And I said, oh, God, reveal to me what would be the most tragic thing that could happen to the full gospel businessmen. Reveal to me what could be the most tragic thing that could ever happen to the full gospel churches or any church on the face of your kingdom here tonight. Oh, God, reveal to me what would be the most horrible and the most terrible thing that would uh, happen, the most awful thing that could happen to me tonight. And you know, the Lord spoke to me so sweetly and gently. He said, the most horrible, the most painful, the most awful thing that could happen is for you to lose sight of me and I would have to take my Holy Spirit from you and I would have to lift my blessing and there would be no more anointing there would be no more the saith the Lord there would be no more preaching under the mighty anointing of God to bring people into the kingdom there would be no more Holy Spirit guidance everybody would build their own graven images and they'd go out to their own gods and they'd go after their own scheme and they would uh, employ their own gimmicks. Uh, that would be, my son, the most awful thing that could happen to any of these you're thinking about or to you personally. Oh, and I cried as David is oh, of old. Oh, my God, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Don't ever let your anointing depart from me. I don't care what kind of bliss I could find in marriage. I don't care what kind of happiness you could find with another mate. I don't care what kind of a temporary enjoyment you could have with luxury and financial prosperity. Oh, it would be absolutely, it would be absolutely tragic to lose out on that, but it would be absolutely fatal, spiritually speaking, and awful, awful, awful to lose, to lose that communication with God and that wonderful Holy Spirit of God and that anointing of the Lord and that communion with Him and, and that wonderful relationship relationship calling you on a first name basis and saying you found favor in my sight you found favor in my sight if you don't want the angel 
fine, I will go with thee. I will walk with you. I will talk with you face to face. I will reveal my ways to you. I will not let you make that mistake. I will not let you fall into error. I will reveal to you face to face my ways. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 This is an awful solemn hour. God will accommodate you. Angels are still around. They can still accompany you. And they will. But there are people here today. There's a people out of the people who are not going to settle for an angel, no matter how glorious that may be. It was glorious. It was glorious. When I had a relationship uh, in the ministry with Oral Roberts and especially my dearest friend William Branham, it was glorious when the angel of the Lord told him to send me overseas and preach to those multiplied thousands of people that were gathered to hear him. It was glorious the way the Lord went before me. But the Lord says, press on. Come on now. Do you want to go the rest of the way, looking back, building on that foundation? Or do you want to go into something more glorious, more glorious, more glorious? Do you want to see arenas filled without any superstars standing on the podium and hundreds of thousands of people filling all the ballparks and all the arenas and all the available auditoriums and open air places for congregating? Do you want to see hearses lined up for city blocks and the dead being raised off of stretchers and Walter Cronkite, if he's still alive, or some of the news anchor men saying, ladies and gentlemen, we do not have any sports events to announce tonight. Every sports arena and every auditorium and every football field all over America is packed and jammed with thousands of people and nobody can get near those places. The people of God are standing for three days and three nights without a change of clothes, without anything to drink, without anything to eat, and people are uh, falling by the thousands on their face reporting God is there the truth. And hundreds and hundreds of thousands of conversions are being reported and a phenomenon has taken place. It seems as though millions have called on the name of the Lord and have been delivered. It seems as though millions have called on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and they have been saved. It is a real phenomenon. Glory to God. And with all the love that I know how to uh, manufacture, or all the love that God has given me, or whatever amount is in me today, I want to say, I want to say what I'm about to say with that employed. God is going to move in spite of unbelieving believers. He's going to find himself a remnant, and if the remnant won't work, he'll get a remnant out of a remnant. And he's going to call many and he's going to have some chosen ones. And if those chosen ones can't see that he is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent, he will even go further and get some chosen from the chosen. And I don't know where, what it will come to, but God's going to have people that will give him the glory and give him the honor and will never be pushy and will never try to make it happen or they'll never rely on an angel. They will rely on communication with God face to face in his word. For in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God the same as in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and God said, stop looking to the man sent from God, and look to the one who sent him. Look to me. I am the light of the world. I am the healer. I am the baptizer. 
God is saying, you stop putting your faith in men who tell you to say, goo, goo, da, 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 and you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost when they say that's it. You do not always have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We are not to seek an experience. We are to seek the Holy Spirit as a person. Amen. But I don't care if you speak with the tongues of angels and of men. You're not going to do your Southern Baptist in. I feel a little poetic today. You're not going to do the, the Nazarenes and the holiness people in. Because believe you me, some of them don't know any more than what you tell them. And they don't know any more than what your ex ecstatic experience consists of. Hate me if you will, but I want you to know God loves me and the Lord Jesus Christ told me I'm his friend and I wouldn't trade that. Even if my ministry comes to an end today, I would not trade that association and that identification with the Lord Jesus Christ for anything in this world for the biggest offering I could get or all the money I could collect. It would mean absolutely nothing compared to the Lord saying, you're my friend, Paul, and I'm calling you by your first name. We are friends on a first name basis. Hallelujah. There was a time when I was called God's man of the hour, and it makes me sick to think about it because that just simply wasn't true. One day when I was living on a mansion on the top of the highest point in Hollywood, California. God spoke to me and said, give all of this junk uh, away. You're in a rat race, and if, even if you win, you're right. I want you for my humble servant. I called you not to be famous. I called you to be obedient. Let Oral Roberts do what he's to do. Fulfill the scriptures he's to fulfill. I looked Oral Roberts in the face recently, and I said, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me for everything I've ever done to, against you or spoken against you. And I said, you have encouraged my ministry. We were friends in 1947, and I met him for the first time and spent time with him and was invited to the social gatherings where he was present. And I said, forgive me. You have been an inspiration to me in my ministry. You have your scripture to fulfill. I'm not to do what Oral Roberts is doing. Leave him alone. He's God man. I'm not a Billy Graham. Neither are you. I'm not a Kenneth Hagin. We were in the same churches together in uh, the Dallas, Texas area in Farmersville, Texas and all around there. But I'm not a Kenneth Hagin and I wish about 500 others would give it up. And let me tell you, I believe that what we need to do is imitate our master and imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't want, uh, I don't want uh, the beauty of some other man's ministry going with me. I don't want an angel going with me anymore. As glorious it, as it has been, there's too much possibility of being deceived. Joseph Smith saw an angel. And I want you to know if I'd listen to every angelic personal prophecy that's ever been uh, shouted over my head, thank God it did go over my head, I would be married to 150 women today and thank God it went over my head. Because your angel, your angel may not be the angel of the Lord because we are living in a day of deception. We need to try the spirits. We need to try the spirits. Let me tell you, I say again, I don't compare myself to this wonderful Moses, but if, if, if God, if you don't go with me the rest of the way, I'm out of the ministry. If you don't go with me the rest of the way, kill me. If you don't go with me the rest of the way, I can't help it, Lord. I love these people, but I can't stand to see God's people taken for a ride in a Cadillac or a Mercedes Benz, and that's all there is to it. Oh, I want God to deal with you face to face, and he may give you more than that to ride around in. 1947, I was standing out on the street hitchhiking on the Highway 67 in Garland, Texas, and I had such simplicity in believing God. I said, oh God, I'm doing Dallas, Texas in 15 minutes, and my mom has always taught me, and the ministry has always taught me since I was nine years of age that a good name is to be desired above many riches. And I used to hate people that would try to destroy my good name. And it kind of became a source of pride. 
because I, I never could live a sinful life. I tried and tried and tried, but it wouldn't work. I just had such a love somewhere in my heart that would always crop up, and I couldn't even, I couldn't even enjoy those things. I was miserable. I don't see how you can. But oh, if you hear the voice that some of us heard, if you have the dealing that some of us has had, you'll never be fit for anything else but to draw nigh to God. Hallelujah. And I was standing there and I said, oh God, I know you deal in miracles and I, I know that I wouldn't want anybody to hear me say this, but Lord, you, you took Elijah up in a whirlwind and you could transport me. You did something for Philip. Would you please get me to Dallas in 15 minutes? And all of a sudden, I don't care whether you believe it or not, it doesn't make any difference with me because there's some of you that do and we are going to have a wonderful time together. Praise the Lord. And do you know, uh, I'll meet you through the door that's closed one of these days. Ah, and you'll meet me. We'll be walking down the street one of these days, and we'll be talking to the Lord face to face. And I'll say, hello there, Ray Biddle. You're feeling wonderful. How am I feeling? Glory to God, and we'll come to the place. Oh, and I said, Lord, get me there. All of a sudden, a combination of hearse and ambulance became, uh, came sailing down Highway 67, and it couldn't even hardly stop. It stopped. It seemed like a, a, a half a mile down the highway. And I thought, oh, Lord, what on earth is going on here? And I ran with all of my might. And I got to that uh, that that uh, ambulance and combination hers. And at that point in my ministry, I had not yet been made perfect, and I was afraid of dead people. And I looked in the back, and there wasn't anybody in there. And the and the the uh, ambulance driver, he said, uh, "Young man, do you want a ride or not?" And I said, uh, "Yes, sir." And I jumped in that uh, hearse, and, uh, that <laughs> that. Uh, uh, ambulance heard and I said sir I don't know how to tell you this but I uh, have to be in Dallas in um, in uh, 10 or 15 minutes and, and it's a very uh, 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 really an emergency and I he said where do you have to go and I said 1101 Ross Avenue and he said young man you are with the right man you just lean back and take it easy and so all of a sudden he got that siren going and he started flashing those red lights. And uh, by the time I opened my eyes, we were at 1101 Ross Avenue in Dallas. And I got out and I looked at him and I said, sir, thank you. Remember these words, Elijah doesn't have anything on me. And I closed the door and ran into the studio. And uh, many years later, David Nunn, who is a, a deliverance healing evangelist, was conducting a meeting on Highway 67 in Cleburne, Texas. And uh, the undertaker that had given me that ride had run across a copy of my life story and had read that incident that I had published in there about being uh, translated in a hearse, uh, in a, an ambulance. And so God moved on his heart. He went to David Nunn and he said, do you know uh, the man who wrote this book? Do you know this man? And David said, yes, we are personal friends and have been for many years. He said, well, I want you to know that I have given my heart to God and to the Lord Jesus Christ after I came across this book because I realized that I had a part to play in the kingdom of God. And it thrilled me so that I gave my heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So I thank God for all those things. But now I can't go back and say, Lord, I'm going to live on that the rest of my life. The Lord said that was rather glorious, wasn't it? You know, you, some of you don't believe God spoke to me today. You don't believe he did, but he did. You think I would stand here and and lie to you my friends I I'm going on 50 and I have I've run the speedometer over several times and people don't know that I'm getting pretty close to really meeting face to face with the Lord I I, I must tell you the truth today and I want to help you today 
But the Lord really spoke to me today. He said, if we, the remnant out there, as many as the Lord our God shall call, if you'll get on your face before God, do you know he'll deal with you on a first name basis? Or do you want to go out here and keep casting out your devils and have, uh, and you say, well, I'm a believer. I speak in tongues. I'm not knocking you. But does the Lord know you by name? Does the Lord know you by name? Why does somebody say, I preach in the street more than anybody else? Lord, did we not preach in the street? Did we not uh, cast out devils and heal the sick in your name? I never knew you. I didn't know your name. Does he know your name? Does he know your name? You say, I'm a prosperous businessman and I've claimed all this through God. But does he know your name? Does he know your name on a first name basis? Could he speak to you and you would know it was his voice? And the Lord talked to me that way. He said, I'm going to talk to people on this last day just like I talked to my servant Moses. Face to face. Face to face. Face to face. I've just had a little inkling of it when the Lord said, tell that woman in Germany who had a goiter the size of the grapefruit, tell her that in five seconds that goiter will disappear. And the police were standing around marshalling those people in that great crowd. And the first thing I did, I looked at the police. I said, Lord, I'm in Germany and I've never been here before. If I tell that woman that gorder is going to dissolve and it doesn't, they'll tar and feather me. They'll, they, those police may take me away. And all of a sudden I knew that it wasn't the angel speaking it was the voice of the Lord, and hastily, when I knew it was, I said, Lady, that tumor, that garter will melt in five seconds, and everyone will know that the Lord is in this place today, and every sinner will be obligated to give his heart to God. Immediately, before I could lay my hand, which has no healing in it, on that garter, that garter disappeared and all there was was a very humorous uh, piece of skin just flopping around. She began to flop that skin around and while hundreds of people came running forward to give their heart to God and one of the pastors of the state church, the Lutheran church, came and fell on his face and gave his heart to the Lord right there in that meeting. Oh my. I said, Lord, I don't care whether he uses me that way or not. If I can just stimulate you and get you to the place where you'll fall before God and say, God, take out all my adultery, take out all my fornication, take out all my uncleanness, take out every wicked way in me. And David said, oh, Lord, I know my heart, know my heart, know my heart, cleanse my heart, cleanse my heart. Let there be no wicked way in me. And take not thy Holy Spirit away from me. He said, I've committed adultery. I failed you. But Take not thy Holy Spirit away from me. I'd rather die than to lose that wonderful Holy Spirit. Can you say amen to that? Israel knew his words. Hundreds of you know his words. God's healed you. But do you know his ways? Do you know his ways? Some of my friends today cannot separate themselves from astrology and from all the ways and guides of the metaphysical world, God has not sent you his angel. We need God to personally guide us. I charge you to read Isaiah chapter 58 in its entirety. God is speaking to every one of you through Isaiah 58. Will you stand please right now? Heavenly Father, 
whatever the world system holds, whatever the world bank, will ever do, we want to know you face to face so you can take us through. And Lord, in a year when even some of your precious servants are prophesying America's greatest year, here almost in shame and almost humiliated the past few days but not today i have had to stand as a voice crying in a charismatic jungle and a pentecostal wilderness and people have thought that i'd come close to blaspheming the holy spirit but oh god may we really know the holy spirit as a person May we know the Holy Spirit is a person. May we know thy word and know the paramount ministry of the Holy Spirit in this full gospel businessmen's meeting is to glorify God. It is to glorify God, not to glorify a prayer language, not to glorify miracles, not to glorify signs and wonders, these automatically accompany when we glorify God. Oh God, you are a God of order. You are a God of law and order. Show us that today. You haven't changed. You're a God of decency. And we have people running all over this place indecently employing gifts of the Spirit who don't even know the Word of God. God, deal with them today. Deal with them today. They bring reproach on the real wonderful working of the Holy Ghost. Lord, we have people commanding uh, as if it were the Holy Spirit speaking, leave this wife and join yourself to this other woman. Or leave this man and, uh, uh, and join yourself to uh, this uh, other organization. Oh my God, show us what it means to know thy word. And come face to face with your word. Let it come alive that we may deal with you face to face. I'm somewhere listening for my name, Lord. I'm standing on a, a little podium here in front of a, a lot of people listening for my name. There are hundreds standing out here hoping to hear their name. And when you call it, they won't need an angel anymore. They won't need a personal prophecy. To guide them, they'll have the mind of Christ to lead them all the way. Amen. I would be remiss if I didn't pray for you. I believe in a sovereign way. How many of you believe God is sovereignty? He's righteousness. He's justice. He's eternal life. He's omnipotence. He's omniscience. He's omnipresent. He is a God of immutability and veracity. If you uh, believe that, say, praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. I love that. Now then, if that be true, could we lay aside the laying on of hands today because it's a custom, a method of the past? I'm not saying we're not to employ it again, but could we just lay it aside for today? Could we lay aside telling someone what to speak so we could clock up another number on our chart saying we, we are, I, 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 I led so many into the baptism during this convention. Could we lay it aside today for the rest of this convention? Could we please and let God do the baptizing? Could we stop shaking people over hell during this convention just for once and trying to mechanically lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ and let them look into your face, let every poor, sick, unbelieving, hungry soul look in your face and see the God who is communed with you shining through because of that refinement that's come? 
They'll fall on their face and they'll worship God and they'll report that God is in you of a truth. I don't like to deal with personalities, but there's something that just makes me weep and weep. Jean Raybard, Carlin, Carlin Jesse's daughter, who's been healed. John, her husband, and Jean are standing over here today, and oh, I love them. God, for a purpose, raised them up with a, a significant role to play in this last day ministry, even of yours truly. Now, let me tell you something, friends. After the visitation of God recently that brought total healing and burned away uh, a possibly malignant tumor and no cancer and stand in the presence of God, Jean was gloriously healed and there's been some kind of relationship with God that makes people hungry just to sit and talk with her. She was walking through an arcade the other day with the joy and the inner peace of the Lord Jesus after communicating with the Lord face to face and an ungodly, unbelieving, unregenerated artist who was living in deg degradation and sin ran away from her paintings where they were selling the paintings in this arcade and ran up to Jean and said, what is it? What is this peace on your face? What does it mean? And when Jean told her the source of her peace and to whom she was committed, and who she had communicated with, that poor searchy, poor soul threw her arms around her and embraced her and wept. Jean did not hand her four things God wants you to know are some kind of a holiness track. People are waiting for you and me to stretch forth hands that bear the marks of Jesus, that have a faith that has his compassion in it because he's called us by our name and we know who we are and we know where we're going. Oh, Father, visit us through, visit us through this presence, visit us through the presence of God, and I scream, I cry, I beg, I plead, I mourn with the people, take not your Holy Spirit from them. Let us come to a place where we know what it is to pray until we hear your voice. Take away the foolishness of this doctrine. If we pray, if we pray, if we pray many prayers, and only one prayer is answered, all the others were in unbelief. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, I don't care how many times you pray, 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 and will I hear from heaven? Will heal your land when you turn from your wicked ways. Oh, I love you, people. You don't, I'm running out now, but I love you. And God's going to visit you, and God is going to heal you. He's going to heal you. How many? I know our time's up. Our time is up. They have to set this banquet up. Or.